Parrots are very social creatures, squawking and screeching to each other in their own language. So when they live with humans, their amazing ability to parrot or mimic our words is really a way for them to interact and communicate with us. <laughs> she likes my singing. Parrots may be birds, but they're definitely not bird brains. Hi, I'm Jack Hanna. Join me on Zoo Life to learn more about the animals of the world. I don't know about you, but when I visit a zoo, I try to picture the animals and the way they live in the wild. And it's such a thrill for me to travel by canoe into the heart of the Central American jungle and experience firsthand the sights, smells, and sounds of wildlife in its natural habitat. Right now, we're going down the Serapiqui River in northern Costa Rica, very close to the border of Nicaragua. And in just a few more miles, we'll be entering one of the most extraordinary rainforests in all of Central America. It's amazing that tropical rainforests occupy less than 7% of the total land surface on Earth. And yet more than 50% of all creatures on Earth call this home. The Costa Rican people take conservation issues very seriously. They've dedicated 20% of their country to national parks and nature preserve. This forest is called Oro Verde, or green gold, which means incredible wealth of the land. The name Costa Rica was given to it by Columbus, and it means rich coast. But the Spanish conquistadors who followed Columbus thought he'd played a nasty joke on them. They thought of riches only as gold or silver. And when they didn't find any here, most of them left for other places. Those who stayed discovered the true wealth of Costa Rica. No other place has been blessed with such a variety of life as this tiny country. And the reason that so much of it remains is the Costa Ricans themselves. Simple, warm, and forward-thinking people Costa Ricans love the land, and they're determined to save it in spite of all the growing threats. That's why so many people from around the world are drawn here to help out. My guide and expert on this trip will be Wolf Bissinger, an attorney from Germany who just kind of said to heck with it all and came to Costa Rica to try and help preserve the tropical rainforest. He has spent tens of thousands of dollars following a dream to save this place for future generations. Why, wow, Wolf? If I won't do it, who will? From here on, it's only river to all the north of Costa Rica. That's the road here. That's the road? Yeah. I hope we don't tip over. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't. We get used. Andale, andale. Vamos, vamos, vamos. Boy, I feel like I'm on the African Queen. Along the way, Wolf spotted a group of howler monkeys. Look, look, look. Oh, yeah. Look. Well, five or six or seven, there's a lot. Wow. Ooh, 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 ooh. Hear them? Yeah. <laughs> How many could be there at there one time? There can be until 30, 35 from one family. There's an old man. The old man makes a noise. Ooh, 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 ooh. See the old. They're looking just down. Yeah. Only, the male, only the male makes a noise. Only the male makes a noise. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> They're so nice. After a long, hard day on the Serapiqui River, it was about time for Wolf to find us a good, safe place to camp for the night. It's getting dark, huh, Wolf? Wolf's been telling me there's nothing to worry about, but I think it might be a little scary, even for me, to spend a night out here in the jungle with all these wild wow, animals. Watch out, it's slippery. I hope there aren't any snakes. Here, Wolf. Okay, now it's good. Okay. It's not that I don't like snakes. It's just that I don't want to be surprised out here by one of those big poisonous ones. Even Indiana Jones had a problem with those guys. They could be anywhere, even in the trees. What about snakes? 
Yeah, there are snakes. But don't worry. You are too big to eat for them. Tell you what, I think I'm going to go to bed. Okay. I'll stay a little out. So nice here. Can they climb in the tent? <laughs> Good night, Jack. After a long and sleepless night, we were back on the river again and on our way north to the Oro Verde Biological Station. Boy, this is beautiful. Jack, this is Oro Verde. This is Green Goat. Wow. Here we are. Now, Wolf, how long did it take you to build this? This is the middle of nowhere. We need about one and a half years to build it up. One and a half years? Yeah. Wow. Very fast. Hmm? We work day and night. What's this, a house here? Yeah, here we have our cabins and the second floor is for students. We have 15 beds in the second floor. Huh. Hello. Back. How are you? Welcome, Jack, to Oroberry. Here we are in the lodge. Hello. How are you? Hello. Hola, chicos, chicas. Hola, como están? Now, how do you say hello in Spanish? Hola. 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 There are a lot of birds here. How many species of birds? About 450. Wow. 450 species here around Oroberry area. You know, Costa Rica is a bird watcher country. Most of the naturalists are bird watchers. Audubon Society come here. Now, what type of bird is this, Wolf? That's a military macaw. Military macaw. Military macaw. Now, is this a young bird? It's a bird, he's about one and a half years old. Where'd you get him? We found him in a jungle farm. Farmer had taken him out of the nest and had him in the wood box, you see. He was nearly dying. So we found him and we brought him here and we thought he will die. Huh? He was in a such bad condition. What will you do here with this bird? Will he, will he be a pet or...? No, 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 never. <laughs> we uh, we all, always in March, April, when, when the birds nest here in the area, we go around and look if the farmers took birds out of the nest. Then we take them away for VR forest guards from the government to bring them here. And then uh, when they are mature, they go away. So this is like a rehabilitation station? That is right. So what do you see as the main problem for these birds? Now the main problem is, is cutting the forest away for this bird, especially this uh, military ah. macaw nests in that what we call almendro tree, a very high tree with very good hardwood. And only in these trees they nest, in old trees. And uh, as we have less and less amendo trees, the bird goes away. But it's a very, very specialized species. This is another reason why we have to protect the rainforest. With less than 500 of these birds left in the area, the work being done here is critical if the military macaw is to survive. But even here at Oro Verde, I found an animal that's not exactly on the endangered list. Hey, Porky, Porky, come here, come here. Hey, don't eat like a pig. Come here, come here, come here. Eat a tomato. Okay. Well, this is the first time I ever had a pig in the kitchen. <laughs> Heard a pig in a poke, but not a pig in the kitchen. Don't eat all my frijoles. I'm hungry. What's his name? Petunia? Gordo. 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 <laughs> Hope you didn't eat everybody's lunch. After Gordo and the rest of us finished lunch, it seemed to me that there was only one thing left to do. Oh, boy. Ah. Uh. Now this is living in the jungle. Heck with that tent stuff. Wow. Looks like a nice day. Yeah. With a good night's sleep and some of Flora's gourmet breakfast under our belts, we headed out for the next leg of our expedition, the Red Frog Forest. <laughs> it wasn't long before we were on the river in search of the poisonous red dart frog. This rare species, which is threatened by deforestation, thrives in the protected rainforest of Oro Verde. Are there a lot of them here? Lots. We have a lot of palms, and that's why we will find. I'm Nobody's sure we will find one. Are they found all throughout Costa Rica, Nicaragua? Uh, in this, in this lowlands, in this swampy lowlands, in this swampy rainforest. Now there are a lot of these in this area. In this area, we have a lot, but we have some special palms, and they nest there. Look at that. Is that a Bushmaster? I've heard these guys can come right after you. Oh. I think this is about as close as I want to get to the most dangerous snake in Latin America. I'll stick with the frogs. This is the only place this frog is found? 
Not the only, but here's the place that we found most of them. And normally, in these areas, you can go one day and you find one. Uh, here, we find them every minute. Mud. Heat. Poison snakes on the loose. This is tougher than life at the Columbus Zoo. After a few more stumbles, we finally came across our first frog. What's that? What's that? I have one. Oh, wow. Well, come. Oh! Uh, come on, see, I'm a green frog. Drama Verde. Oh, you found one? Yeah, look at this. Oh, look. Good. Wow. The green. So this is this is called the poison arrow frog? Yeah, it's a poison, one of the two. We have the green ones and we have the red ones. Now, how poisonous, how poisonous is Badly. this? Badly. Mm -hmm. The Indians took it for their arrows mm -hmm. and they hunted and they killed. It's amazing, something that little can be that deadly. Yeah, you press it and there's a liquid coming out of the skin. Oh, the skin. And that's the poison. I mm -hmm. see. You can hell it, that doesn't hurt you, but if you get this poison in your blood, you die. It's a nerve poison. It's deadly. Fraser. La gusta Ronda Verdes. Si. Me gusta Good. mucho. <laughs> he likes you, Frazier. Yeah. He's a big one, huh? It's yeah. Very big. It wasn't long before we spotted a red frog. Oh, yeah. Red frog, baby. Uh, they are so, so, so cute. Uh, oh, yeah. Red frog, baby. You wow. see, that's a red. You see the blue leg? Yeah. yeah? This is the the poisons too, right? That is more poison, they say, than the other. Now, this is as big as they get? That is the normal size. That should not get bigger. So they're not threatened right now? They are threatened. They are threatened. You'll find them only in this area. It's only in this place for this huge amount of special palms that we find so many in this small area. And this is what we call red frog. So you bought this to protect the frog, really? Yeah, yeah. So what you're doing, Wolf, is you are basically saving this species of frog. Yeah, that's you, what we do. Do you feel proud or...? That's so necessary, you see. <laughs> you let him go? Go on. Yeah. We were back on the river now, continuing on our way to the Nicaraguan border. How you doing? Is this, Nic is this Nicaragua? Nicaragua? Yeah. Como se llama monkey? Mono, this is mono, 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 mono. 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 Mm -hmm. What's mono nombre? Uh, 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 Daniel nombre is the mono. Uh, Francisca. Francisca se llama. Francisco. Now, now, how did he find this monkey, spider monkey? Uh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo lo encontraste? Ah, tirado y cayó la mama, la curamos, se fue la mama ah, y quedó él. The, 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 the mother, the mother sí. fell down and lost him. Huh? Oh, really? As a baby. Sí. Huh? Are there, Wolf, are there a lot of spider monkeys around here? There's still a lot, yeah. We have three spiders, huh? then the, the, the uh, Congos, what we call it, this uh, howler monkeys, and the white face. Oh, you have the capuchin, the mm -hmm. howlers, and mm -hmm. the spiders. Yeah, that's the three we have here. Now, are, are they endangered at all here, the spiders? The, the, in general, in Costa Rica, they're endangered. In Nicaragua, in Nicaragua there's some much okay, more. Okay, okay. Let's see you, Francisco. You can let him go. Yeah. Go, bye-bye. In just three more hours, we would be approaching our final destination. 10,000 acres of untouched primary rainforest, home to thousands and thousands of mammals and birds. This part of Oro Verde contains riches that no amount of money could ever buy. How old are these trees? And these trees are between 150 years and 500 years, 600 years. Oh, look at this. What Heliconia. kind of flower? What is this? Heliconia. Heliconia? Yeah. That's one beautiful. of the four species of Heliconia we have. Now it's full with water. Oh, it holds water. Yeah, they hold water. It's all water in, you see? Beautiful. Yeah. Vamonos. Yeah. This is all the trees are cutting down. Yeah. We say this sort of rainforest lasted three million of years to build them up how they are now. Huh? And you cut it away and that is a gun forever. For this moment now, uh, the biggest threat is the banana farming in Costa Rica. You see, the banana price went up so high, and now they cut the last jungles to plant banana. 
Wolf, now that the price of land is so high for people to grow bananas, if I offered you $3,000 an acre, would you take it? No. But that's not why I bought it. I bought it to preserve it. And I have no more interest to get a rich man. I am rich enough, you see, with this forest. That's it. People must think you're crazy. <laughs> they thought I'm crazy. Now no. uh, they don't think it anymore. I'm a rich man. I'm a wealthy man. I have green gold here, you see. I have thousands of acres green gold. I cannot be richer in this, wor in this world. Look around. Look all these trees, look all this epiphyte where it's sitting there. You can go hours and hours and hours here and you feel so good. You cannot buy something like this with money. <laughs> Listen. Green gold. That's green gold. Yeah, that's wealthy. Oh. Now it's quiet. And you don't know why. And then they begin once more. It's beautiful. Huh? Sometimes it's hard to understand the connection between a big city like this and a remote tropical rainforest. But the San Francisco Zoo is doing their best to bring them both together. You know in a sense, that's exactly what all zoos do. They're a bridge, just like the Golden Gate here, between our fast-paced modern urban world and those remote parts of our planet where wildlife still roams free and the only sounds you hear are the sounds of nature. The Francisco Zoo has just about every kind of animal you'd expect to find. And then some. But on my last trip there, I saw something I hadn't seen before. What's this thing? Mm. Parking meter looks like. I wonder why a parking meter be in the center of a zoo. Sure is strange looking, you know it. Saving rainforest habitats is something that a lot of us are concerned with. But Norm Gershens, director of the Ecosystem Survival Plan of the San Francisco Zoo, has come up with a whole new twist. So, Norm, how did you come up with this idea of parking meters to save rainforest? Well, actually, I was challenged. A gentleman, when I told him I worked at the San Francisco Zoo, he said, well, zoos don't do a heck of a lot, a heck of a lot for conservation, do they? And it was, all of a sudden, it became a personal challenge. And I realized that maybe zoos need to do a lot more. It's so... Someone comes up here, they put, they put a quarter, a nickel, or a dime in, right? Mm -hmm. And they turn a little thing here. But this isn't an average parking meter. In other words, when you put your money in, you have an active hummingbird, that's it. We have to put your quarter in so you can save. I'm going big time. I'm putting a quarter in. <laughs> wow. This, the program itself probably can raise, we figure, if we get about 100 meters in zoos across the country in aquariums, maybe a million dollars a year. So how much land do you hope to save in these, in these countries uh, by putting money in the meters? Well, actually, it's hard to believe, but for $300, you can buy two and a half square acres of rainforest land. So all the monies that come from these meters, you send directly to purchasing uh, habitat, what, in Central South America? We've worked in Costa Rica and Belize, and it actually can work all around the world. But right now, in Central and South America, the tropical rainforest obviously are being destroyed something like 50 acres a minute. And so this way, it allows the average common man and the common woman and the common child to come and interact at the zoo and put money in this conservation meter and save wildlife. Let's see, what does it say? Your money goes directly toward the purchase and protection of endangered habitats around the world. And it says for every two and a half acres of South American rainforest protected, you have saved one out of 1,000 jaguars, spider monkeys, anteaters. The reason that I came up with this program is because I feel like we're running out of time. And if we look to save the tiger or the panda, 
we're going to run out of time completely. So if we have to look at saving entire systems, so if you save the entire system or you save tropical areas, you'll save the jaguar, you'll save the toucan, you'll save the spider monkey and the kikachu. And it's as easy as just a flick of the wrist, in this case, with the conservation meter. More than 60% of all living things on our planet exist only in the tropical rainforest. Costa Rica. Young people are coming from around the globe to learn about what's being done here to protect wildlife and to lend a hand themselves. When I learned about the valuable research on monkeys that Holly Ferret and some fellow American students were doing along the Corobisi River, I decided to go have a look. I couldn't resist the whitewater raft trip downriver to get to the monkey research station. Holly, what do you think it is that brings young people to Costa Rica to study all these animals? Well, I think that Costa Rica is a very easy place to work. It's, it's friendly, uh, the language is easy to learn, the people are very patient, and for me it was the monkeys that brought me here. You think it's because there are a lot of wild animals still left here in, in forest? Exactly. It's very easy to walk along and catch a glimpse of a wild peccary or a monkey or huh. some exotic bird. Now, aren't you afraid out here sometimes in this jungle? My friends always tease me about having to carry machetes or something with me, but <laughs> I've never been bitten by a snake. Have you always liked working with primates? Well, my first experience working with the primates outside was in Madagascar. Now, what, what type of studies are you doing here? Right now, we're, we're focusing on feeding ecology of these animals. So we come out here every day from 5.30 to 5.30, and we have our little computers, and we take every kind of data, anything they do. They move, we record it. Now, Holly, I, I keep hearing these monkeys up here. How many are up there? Well, this is, should be about seven animals in this group. There's two adult males and four adult females, and then a scattering of, of infants and babies. Now, why do they call them howler monkeys? Well, the males have this loud vocalization, which sound, it mo sounds more like a bark, like a dog, than a howl. But... Show me how it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Something like that. <laughs> That's more well, like Tarzan. I hear, I hear they're calling back. <laughs> yeah. Golly, do that again. <laughs> you sound just like a howler monkey. Yep. Well, that's how we find them every day. In the morning, we walk around and howl and howl until someone answers us back. Now, are howler monkeys family structured? Um, a normal group size is about like this. It's a harem kind of group. There's two males, four or five adult uh, females, and then a scattering of babies. And the howlers live in strips of forest that are in between the cattle pastures. They leave just enough as windbreaks so that there's, howlers can live in the, the areas. Do you think Costa Rica is doing a pretty good job preserving their wildlife? I think so. I think they're definitely a role model for other countries, and from what I've seen here, I'm very hopeful for the future. Now, what, what type of trees are these? Now, this is a mango tree. This, is, this tree is right on the border of two, two groups, so it's a big territory. A lot of fights happen in this tree because they love to eat green mangoes. So, in other words, the mangoes are main diet? Jeepers! He hit you with the mango! Yep, that's what they eat. Do they do that often? Throw, them at Throw things at you? Well, they we probably run out on their patience with us, so. Hey, take this back. Hey, stop it. Take this hey. back. <laughs> there, I got him. He didn't catch it though. Hey. <laughs> it's amazing they know how to do that. Yeah. Well, they'll break branches and, and throw whatever they can find up there, and sometimes they even do something else on you. I'll so. tell you what, if they're gonna do that, yeah. bit, I don't want to have them do that on me. Let's get out of here. Okay. You like it here? Yes. Don't want to leave. I think I'll probably, as soon as I finish school, graduate work, I'll be back here to stay. Studies have shown that one of the most popular exhibits in zoos are snakes. But here at the Glodomiro Picado Institute in Costa Rica, important research is taking place that's helping to save human lives, as well as provide a better understanding of these exotic creatures. When you visit other parts of the world, one of the things you learn is that kids are kids wherever you go. In whatever language they speak, they're all infatuated with snakes. At the Glodomirog Institute, they had some of the most exotic poisonous snakes I'd ever seen. 
You know, it's really an education to see how young children relate to snakes. They haven't yet learned to fear these creatures the way a lot of people do when they get older. Their teacher told me that these kids had seen snakes at the zoo, but had never been to the institute or seen how venom was taken from snakes to make snake bite serum. Even with the deadly fur lance, probably the most dangerous snake in Latin America, the kids were fascinated, not repulsed or frightened. Personally, I was glad to be on the safe side of the glass window. But Dr. Jose Gutierrez, the director of the Institute, has spent most of his life on the inside working with these animals. Doctor, we saw the children here looking at snakes and they're having fun and that type of thing, but what's the serious work that goes on at the Institute here? Uh, one goal is to produce the anti-venom to be used uh, as the only treatment available in Central America for snake bite envenomations. What snakes cause the worst bites in Costa Rica and Central America? By far the Ferdialans is responsible not only for the majority of the accidents but also for the most serious accidents because it's widely distributed in the tropical rainforest and it injects a large amount of venom. So usually accidents by this snake are severe. What's, what purpose do snakes serve? The snakes uh, play a very important role in, in the ecology of our jungles and we try to communicate that to the population because people don't have to be fearful of snakes, they have to be respectful of snakes because they are not aggressive. Usually when a snake bites somebody it's because that person step on, 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 this, on the snake. The snake is not aggressive uh, in principle because for a snake there is no advantage of biting a, a, a human being. Now I certainly agreed with everything Dr. Gutierrez had said, but when they asked me to help them milk one of the fur de lances, my respect became even healthier. Uh, if you want you can hold the tail. Hold the tail, but take care with the... With to, the... to produce the anti-venom you have first to obtain the venom from the snake. Then with that venom, you inject that venom in the horse in such a way that you inject a tiny amount and then every week you increase a little bit of the venom that you are injecting. The horse uh, produces antibodies or defenses against the venom, which are in the blood. So you take the blood to the laboratory and you purify the antibodies so that the final preparation of anti-venom is a purified preparation of antibodies made against venom components. You know, exactly. the, the horse really is the producer of the anti-venom. Exactly. That's the real factory, in a way. Sing. Oh, you got him? Yeah. Okay. Can I let go? Yeah, bring me, bring me the, the, the tail okay. here. Okay. Okay, thanks. See you later. No, can you open the, the box, please? You want me to open the box? Yeah. Okay, now wait. Turn to the this one. Because I want to be able to run when I open the box. Yeah, yeah. Just... Okay, thanks. No, that's okay, like this. Huh? Okay, like this. I move? Yes, yes. Today we're going to learn about snakes. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Watch. Watch the jungle jack. Jungle jack. No problem. There's no reason to fear snakes, whether they're poisonous or non-poisonous, like the one here with the doctor. Come here. Who wants to Come here. Not all snakes are poisonous. In fact, most are not. The key is healthy respect for these animals. See, now every, everybody's brave. Now, now see, everybody's brave. Costa Rica was attracting environmentalists and animal lovers long before it became fashionable in the United States. And when you see this place, the lush landscape, and the incredible variety of wildlife, it's not hard to see why. To this remote area in southern Costa Rica, two bird lovers came to work over half a century ago, leaving their comfortable home in the States. And Alexander Scutch, the world's foremost authority on Costa Rican birds, has been living here with his wife ever since. The pictures of the eating all the bananas that were there, I'll put up another. That's a good idea. You've lived here how long in the jungle? 51 years. Right here at this very same house? Right in this house, yes. What was it like then, 51 years ago? There was much more forest and fewer people. Life was much simpler, cheaper, and I think more helpful. <laughs> this is where you've always studied birds? In this farm, mostly. That's something. That's something. So how many species of birds are here? We have identified about 300 species on the farm. 
Do you see fewer now? There are fewer, yes. It makes me sad. Why? What, what's happened? Well, deforestation, uh, spreading of uh, poisons of pesticides and herbicides around. In Costa Rica, would you say this country has done, a, they're trying, it seems, better than other countries to preserve their forest? They're trying hard. Well, they're not trying to uh, control population. Many years ago, Sir Julian Hudson said that uh, somebody is to be greatly censured if the world population were to exceed three billion, and now it's on the way to six billion, I believe. It's more than this old planet can sustain. The Earth can only support a certain number of creatures, and if man becomes too numerous, some other animals have to disappear. If everybody lived like you did, with no electricity, and water out of the streams, and took a bus, the world would be much better off. It certainly would, I think. Instead of getting into a car every time you want to go three or four blocks in a city. <laughs> Plus, look at your lawnmower here. Right. Doesn't take any gas. No, it's... <laughs> the lawnmower is self-powered, you might say. The lawnmower is powered by the grass it cuts. <laughs> That's right. The lawn... <laughs> well, I guess the time's come to go watch the birds. I think so. Let's All go right. and sit on the porch. Oh, great. How many books have you written? I've published about 26. Now, how did you write 26 books? Did you write by kerosene light? Oh, no. Well, most uh, I write by day and read by night. 26 books on birds? Not all the books are on birds. I've written some on philosophy. 51 years of bird watching that's produced pages and pages of valuable data that other scientists around the world can share. It takes a lot of love and caring to do something like that. When I was thumbing through one of Alexander's books, I stumbled on a quote that summed it all up for me. Life is a tree of many branches, he writes, none of which can become overgrown at the expense of the others without destroying the symmetry and balance of the tree. So I guess philosophy and bird watching aren't so far apart after all. Watching these incredible creatures, we begin to understand how interconnected all living things really are. Keep on going. There we go. Look at there. You know what you just did? You helped save his home. That corner went to help save Mr. Kinkachu. So what you just did, and now that just helped save some more home. You're saving the tropical rainforest. In zoos, as well as in places like Costa Rica, we're trying to do much more than save just certain endangered species. We're trying to save entire ecosystems made up of birds, reptiles, and many creatures that inhabit the same environment. So let's all put a few more quarters in the environmental parking meters to save a few more acres of tropical rainforest so that future generations can enjoy these magnificent creatures for years to come. Anheuser-Busch Theme Park's Conservation Moment. The Pledge Made Real. Most of us may never actually visit a rainforest, but thanks to education programs like this one at Busch Gardens, Tampa, park visitors have an opportunity to meet and learn about the animals that live there. So you're gonna wanna pet him towards his tail. Shaman is from Central America. Uh, there are a variety of countries down there that have a lot of rainforest areas. You know, you speak of, of rainforest. You know, we hear about all the trees being cut down and all the disaster there and plants, but some people don't realize that that's the animals' homes and they're, and they're gone. Correct. There are a lot of animals that live in the, the rainforest. Actually, some of the greatest uh, diversity of life is found there. So in other words, if, if the trees and the rainforest are all cut down, this animal is doomed. 
As a matter of fact, this one more than others usually is doomed first. They are um, generally eat only the very ripe fruits. And um, as most of us know, it's the uh, adult trees that produce the ripe fruits. And those are the first to be harvested from the rainforest. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> and he is just all worked up, Jack. He has fallen for you, that's for oh, sure. Oh, well, at least somebody likes me in the zoo. <laughs> These are favorites with children. The snake? A very large snake. Who is this, boa derrick? This is a boa constrictor. So in other words, you're teaching the children from an early age not to have this fear that a lot of adults seem to have today. People pick up their parents' fears. So maybe while they're young like this, we can help them to see that they don't have to be afraid of an animal just because it likes to be out at nighttime or it's found underneath things. Whether or not the boa will still be found underneath the rainforest canopy, will depend on the efforts of future generations. And this is how it begins. Our feel is very smooth and it's very dry. Anheuser-Busch theme parks, the pledge made real.